Good morning. How is the energy? Where are we? Let me see. Is your energy kind of moderate? Uh, quite far down or like up there somewhere? Oh, that's good. I never, that's a new one. It's doing this. That's a, that's a nice way to start your morning. Uh, welcome back to the fourth or the third, it's very confusing at this point, day of Creative Brain Week. Uh, a day which builds on the themes of the two days before. So we started on Tuesday with attention. Yesterday we had a really busy, full, impactful day looking at connection. And today it's all about love. In brackets, maybe when it's not enough or when it's not enough. So this morning session uh, is the sort of check-in. It's a it builds on the reflection of the night before. It's, it's what kind of conversations are people having with themselves, with each other, what's coming out of the uh, people that are on the stage. Um, it's also a chance for me to do a quick bit of housekeeping and updating. So, um, sorry online people, but for the Living Lab today, we will start a little bit later with all of them except for Mike Hanrahan's. Let me try and explain that in a simple way when my brain kicks in. So we have a quick check-in. Then we have the 10 till 12 slot, which is a fantastic series of presentations. Uh, Redmond O'Connell, uh, Sissy Fu, uh, Tracy Naledi, with a response from Siobhan McArdle and John uh, Farrelly. And then at 12 o'clock, in the normal run of things, we would go to the living labs. But what we're going to do today is uh, Mike Hanrahan has been exploring what is the sound of dementia. And it turns out it's quite loud. <laughs> so we will do the sound of dementia for sort of the first 15 minutes or so at the 12 o'clock break. And then the other living labs will start. There's no point in competing. If you've not had a chance to go and look at what's growing in those living labs, when there's a break, pop out and have a look. You might have a look at the end of this session. So the breaks and joins piece down the end is becoming a gallery of really delicate little tiny breaks and joins pieces. And Sue Mayo would be with us this afternoon to talk more about that, the bigger part of that project. But it's building day on day. Upstairs, go upstairs and turn around. The first door on your left is where Trudy Meehan has been exploring what is, what's love in the body? Where does it fit? And if you just open the door and peek in, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, the other exhibitions, the, the uh, one in six by 2030 exhibition is been there all week. You can use the little iPad by the entrance to see all the other stories that we weren't able to bring into Dublin, all the other photographers around the world that are making statistics visible. What does an aging population look like? What are those lives like? What are the photojournalist narratives of those all around the world? Um, and they're about to announce shortly their next statistic. So have a look at the website and follow it. And then upstairs, um, there's a little snapshot of arts and health from Ireland from the last 30 years and ongoing. And as part of this afternoon session, we will have uh, little moments of, of works in progress individuals usually or small groups of people that are making extraordinary beautiful driven by love i think projects and we want to introduce those to you uh, and they are continuing the lineage of that kind of work we'll also be joined by christopher bailey the director of the world health organization's arts and health program who has spent this week in a car so while we've been here in dublin and while the Jamil group have been meeting across the road in the Royal Irish Academy of Music, he's been out in West Cork, in Limerick, and in Galway, meeting small local projects that are changing the culture of the place that they're in. Uh, so Justine Foster is up there somewhere in the darkness. Hello. It's very quiet. Hello, Justine. Yeah, she's there somewhere. Um, and she met with Chris on Monday and introduced Chris to the, 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 the results of 30 years of uh, resilient practice. So uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, the Travellers Health Group in Limerick, the Grown Your Hopes Music Project. We're going to talk about the work that Salter are doing, Helium Arts are doing in Galway, Create are doing. And uh, so it should be a rich and interesting 
conversation in that two till four slot, the end of that two till four slot. Uh, and somewhere between Sue Mayo, who starts that slot, and Chris, who ends it, uh, are Alex Kornhuber and a really gorgeous project about and made with and for and by people living with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, and also this incredibly beautiful project made by nurses um, trying to find a way to support parents whose babies, whose newborns have died. It's an incredible thing, the quiet path. So please join us for those. And then the final session, we wrap up, but we go back to Tracy. Sorry, we go back to Tanisha Hill Jarrett's questions from the start of the week. We go back to Morag Anderson. We go back to where we started to see where we've got to. Um, so this session is always picking up on things that happen throughout the week one of, and also trying to catch those things that may not have happened that we don't want to disappear. So I'm going to invite Orton to come and join me and to kick off this little short session. Hello, everybody. OK, I wasn't sure that is a loud mic. I have a terribly quiet inside voice, so I, I do need to be mic'd. I don't think I can shout. I don't think that's within my powers. Um, I didn't do it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I have really, really enjoyed spending this time with you this week. And I'm going to join Dominic in just a second to get that conversation going. But before I do, I thought it would be nice to introduce you a little bit to some of the work that I do. And then, if it's all right, to guide us through a very, very, very short um, light meditation on sound and the ways in which sound noise is sometimes more like touch, that things like this can be quite intimate, that just listening is a form of love, that that kind of attention can be a form of care. So the project that I'm currently working on is actually a history of science program that's looking at technologies of silence, usually technologies of silence used during wartime, and I'm looking at all of the different relationships that form in, term, in times of crisis, specifically during World War II and the Cold War, and transfers and transformations of knowledge around silencing technologies, specifically around something called an anechoic chamber. Anechoic literally means free from echo. Imagine a room covered in spikes, which sounds quite strange to be inside of, and it's kind of like a net for echo, so essentially, those walls absorb sound, and the only thing you hear is pure sound. In 1952, the artist, composer, and potentially original troll, uh, John Cage, went into an anechoic chamber, a dead room at Harvard. And he described listening to just the sound of his clothes moving against his body, and said he heard one high sound and one low sound. And that later, the engineer told him that one was the blood rushing through his head, and the other one was his um, maybe nervous system. That is not true. He did not hear his nervous system. You can't hear your nervous system. But you can hear your heart beating your ears. And if you're quiet enough, you can hear your own life inside of your body. This deeply, deeply intimate moment inspired all sorts of extraordinarily creative acts. The Fluxus movement that he took down with him to Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where I'm from. And so today, I want to direct your attention inside to the life inside of you, to the sounds inside of you, just for a moment, if you'll let me. So when you're ready, I'll invite you to close your eyes or just look down. All I want you to do is kind of direct your attention away from sight and just listen to the sound of my voice. How does sound get into your head? Sound is just vibrating waves of air. From my voice to you, my voice box compresses air. That air travels through space into your ear, into a little tunnel. Waves of diffused air become focused and channeled into your eardrum, which vibrates a few very small bones. Those bones transmit the vibration into the salty sea, where tiny microscopic hairs, almost like seaweed, grow from inside your ears. And the hairs become active when bent by these salty waves. 
When the hair cells bend, charged molecules flood inwards and activate the cell. So, sounds are channeled by the shape of your ear and disturb the small bones. The bones oscillating make waves in the salty fluid, rocking the hairs, and the hairs set off electricity. The language of neurons, or the tap, tap, tap game of wires that your brain uses to whisper to itself all day. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. I think it's important when we talk about love, when we talk about attention, when we talk about connection, not to lose that with ourselves as well and to have a moment of appreciation for all the sensorial systems that connect us to ourselves, the world, and one another. And to take a moment to think about how extraordinary the interface is of these senses to your brain. Your brain is inside of its shell. It's separate from the world. So to take moments, I think, to be grateful for these moments of connection that our bodies give us to the outside world and this extraordinary translation that's happening all the time. So with that, I'll sit down with Dominic and we'll get chatting. One sec. <laughs> okay, that's not helpful. Brian, what time is it? Perfect, perfect. So uh, I am by trade a carnivalist, and uh, but I'm also by study a fine artist. And one of the persons I studied, strangely enough, was John Cage and Black Mountain College. Yeah, and yeah, you're at Black Mountain College. Um, and so there are so many things about Cage and Black Mountain that I love. Um, but what's relevant for this, I think, is. Um, Firstly, in Black Mountain, what they tried to do was they were inspired by Bauhaus. So Bauhaus traveled over from Europe during the Second World War, or as that was beginning, and seeds Black Mountain College, and it take time to look it up. It's an extraordinary place, which is based in creativity as a research practice. I guess that's one way of thinking about it. They don't have disciplines in the same sense. And from that come an enormous number of uh, creative movements, but also engineering and audio experiments. Huge. That's Minster Fully. That's exactly where I was going. Yep, old bookie. So uh, we talked on Tuesday about the idea that uh, ideas have homes. They have geographic spaces. They grow from places. Sometimes it's a bar. Sometimes it's a university. Sometimes it's you know, bombed out places in Paris. And uh, an aspiration with Creative Brain Week, and one reason for not making a gigantic haul, is that we can do a little temporary moment in time. But I really think that those temporary moments in time in a globalized world, uh, or, or those kind of Black Mountain College places need to work a little differently. What's also interesting for me, listening to you talk, is that last night I went to see the tightrope walker the solo sirens, Jenny McDonald piece. And it was lovely to sit in a theater with no responsibility. It's great. <laughs> it's a gorgeous thing to do. Um, and to, to listen to Jenny talk about her journey through a hospital. And it began with uh, an empty stage. And on one side of the stage are four audience members who are in a waiting room. They didn't realize until they came in, but they're in a waiting room. And on the other side is the person in charge of the sound and lighting desk. And the person in sound of the sound and lighting desk says, this is a theater. This is a waiting room. In the distance, you can hear a phone ringing just faintly. In the distance, you can hear a trolley on a corridor and introduced by soundscape a hospital, wait, hospital waiting room. And it was a really lovely way of just tuning in. And then the rest of the show uh, is a really, a, a, it's, it's a piece of theatre, but it's also a, a moment of care, a moment of care for an audience, a transmission of care through the medium of theatre. Somebody talked yesterday about uh, 
uh, a hospital for the soul, I think was the phrase they used. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, Marnie? Yeah. Yeah. And so in the post-show discussion, that's what people began to talk about. How do you make a hospital for the soul? How do you really deal with breakages and, and those things, as well as what must be broken, as Sue would say? Murray, are you going to join us or are you going to stay there? Yeah, Come do. hang out with us. <laughs> I think one of the other things that's really interesting... Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> one of the other things that's really interesting, there's um, a real overlap between what happened at Black Mountain College in North Carolina and what is going on today. These people had very, very, very different backgrounds and extremely different practices. Artists, engineers, dancers, scientists, all coming together and finding that kind of parody of esteem, which is something I found yeah. really, really interesting throughout the week, that the experiences of patients, the experiences of scientists, the experiences of artists, the knowledge each one of these people embodies and brings to the table is given that parody of esteem and the appropriate level of respect that allows for these really, really fascinating and fruitful conversations to take place where we can learn from one another because that respect is there across the board. It becomes a really generative environment, a really creative environment. And with that, I want to I'm going to wait a second because I want to build it, then I'm going to go, I have a plan. Never mind. But okay, <laughs> it's real love, it's not television. Yeah, so I'm going to come tomorrow in a minute. Um, so, um, Paul Farmer, hmm. accompaniment, okay? So Paul Farmer, uh, MD in Haiti, but also a, I think the head of American training college for, for medical practitioners, uh, died about two years ago, very sadly too young, but also uh, bridged various types of discipline and brought from one discipline to another this idea that perhaps one part of medical practice is accompaniment. The idea that what people need when they are unwell, in whatever state that is, is someone who stands by their side, who does not go away, who is a consistent friend, yeah, who stays with them, uh, regardless. And uh, for me, that's been a theme that's been popping up all week. How do we, how do we accompany each other? You know, we are here for a short space of time. Yeah. News from the great beyond is at best and reliable. So how do we do this bit between birth and death? And then what is the thing that pulls us to do things that are extraordinary, more than ordinary? Um, so I'm going to introduce Morag, and then I'm going to bring it back and do a little wrap-up thing. But uh, you have something for us, I think, do you? Jenny's um, play last night was absolutely astounding. If you weren't there and you get the opportunity to go and see it, do. Um, for me, she was an embodiment of the lived experience. Yeah. Um, and we've talked a lot about that this week. Policymakers, researchers, um, all of these things are essential. But when we have a lived experience threaded through, it makes, it makes a big difference. Um, connections, obviously, we... we we sort of dwelled on that yesterday. That can be um, to a person, to a place. In Gaelic, uh, Scots Gaelic, my um, mother tongue, we call it duchas, which means a sense of, of belonging, a sense of attachment. It doesn't even have to be somewhere that you've ever been to. Um, in fact, yesterday you were saying that you arrived in Edinburgh several years ago and just thought, this is where my heart belongs, uh, which is which is great. I have no ownership of Edinburgh, but I'm delighted that you want to be, be part of Scotland. One thing that keeps me connected um, to my mother, who died when I was when I was quite young, is this tiny little pair of gold gold hoop earrings. The day she died, I took them from her ears and I, I threaded them through my own. I felt I needed to keep some of her warmth. And for a long, long time, it was a real source of anxiety to me that I might lose them, that they might unhinge and, and, and drop out. And, I, you know, the, the unhinging wasn't lost on me. And it took me years to accept that at some point they will return to the earth. And that's absolutely fine because that's where they came from. And the poem that I wrote years later was actually stimulated. I was at... Um, 
the Blue Dot Festival at Jodrell Bank Observatory in England. It's a science and, and, and music festival, fantastic festival. And I was at a lecture about polar research and there's this big red hulled ship breaking up ice. And when I get sort of thoughtful, I sort of twiddle these, these little earrings. So I then wrote this poem titled it Kintsugi. For those of you that don't know, Kintsugi is the Japanese art of repairing broken things with gold. So rather than hiding our history, you know, it's, it's okay for that to be visible. Kintsugi. I unhinge golden hoops from still soft lobes with the delicacy of horology. Curve the memory of her warmth vital as the weight of a bee through my own ears. Careful not to crease the stained sheet that hides her wounds from neck to navel. My leg pressed to hers mourns the transfer of heat. A red hulled ship ploughing through ice fields, sealing the fractures with seams of gold. I've worn these earrings for 30 years, every single day. So they are my, my personal kintsugi. Thank you, Dominic. Do you have a second one? <laughs> the boy who was once more. <laughs> yeah, go on. I'm going to be indulgent because I read a poem yesterday, I recited one at the reflection session, so apologies if, if you were there and, and I'm repeating it, but um, so many people came up to me afterwards um, and just said how, how much it had affected them, so I'm going to share it with you, um, just in case you weren't here, because it, it seemed to, to touch. It was written for my, for my daughter when she really annoyed me, um, <clears throat> and I went back and I rewrote it and I, I flipped it from a negative to a positive. I didn't want to be reminded um, at a future date. And actually that was a wonderful thing that Jenny MacDonald said um, in her show last night, that for her, um, writing is a way of moving beyond the problem that you're in at that moment, knowing that you'll be able to look back at this tangible piece of something and know that you've, you've, you've moved on, you're, 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 you're out of that, of that space, whatever it happens to be. Um, so I learned that fetal cells migrate from the baby into the mother in every pregnancy, whether it's a live birth or not, whether it's um, one of multiples, whether it's male or, or female, the mother will, will retain some, some cells, these uh, microchimeric cells. And at a later date, even decades later, they can migrate to the source of, of injury. Um, so things like autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is a possibility. Ultimately, the mother is the host and this growing being wants to make sure that she, she remains the host for, for it. Migration. Long after my shelter body shucks her reluctant skull from my shell, her fetal cells, rose foamed in my core, migrate to mend my flensed heart. Drawn to salt tides and moon-dipped pools, she moves east with scatter light, forgets to look west where night falls last. Distance turns everything blue. I peel a peraldom of song from my mother tongue, seal it in bottle glass, send it on the carrying stream. She grasps freedom, swims her own rhythm. I name the space between us, broken water. Claim it, beautiful daughter. Thank you. I think even on a second hearing, what I, what it strikes me, what strikes me so much is this negative into a positive and the re-examination too of a love and love can be complicated. There are times when you feel such extraordinary frustration when there's so much friction between us. 
And then to have this poem as a bomb, as a healing, as an experiment, as a meaning making, as a re-examination of this love that's constantly, constantly changing and evolving. And I think there will probably be a lot of pieces that resonate with all of Morag's poetry, but especially this one, I think today, I'm really glad that's the one that you decided to say again, because I thought it was beautiful. My mother is, you know, over 4,000 miles away, and we're very, very close. I'm an only child, and she always says that I was a, I'm a piece of her, but she's a piece of me too. And that really, 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 it just speaks to me. I think it's a beautiful piece of work. And so I look forward to seeing today what will emerge, what connections will emerge between the different panels and the speakers that we hear, and acknowledging too the, the frictions in love, that it's not all sweet, that sometimes it's not enough, that there's an ugliness to a love too, but that at the end of the day, it's something so, so, so beautiful that makes life so worth living. So I'm going to bring this to a close with probably two or three things. First thing, is there any Irish speakers in the audience? No. Is there any Irish speakers in the audience? Gaelic speakers. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's the, I live in the, I live in the shadow of the other. I, that's it. Say again. And it translates as I live in the shadow of the other. Yeah. People live in the shadow of the other. Thank you. Yeah, gorgeous, lovely thing. In language lives all the clues. Um, I am thinking about the conversations I have uh, with the Maori and Aboriginal Torres Island Straits people that are part of the Atlantic Fellowship where they talk about thinking seven generations back, seven generations forward. And that's a planning cycle. That's a strategic way of thinking about change and development in the world. I'm thinking about your poem about the mother and the daughter, which is about you in the middle and what you transfer between them. I'm thinking about the movement of uh, nutrients that we saw in the marshmallow laser feast and the fact that if you spread that out over time, that means us. We are the nutrients. We are the value system that sits in the middle. And so we inherit the dreams of our grandparents, but what do we want to leave? We inherit the dreams of our grandparents manifest as systems, as healthcare systems, as societies, as strategy. What do we want to leave? And I'm thinking about you. Because like the person who said yesterday, there's a lot going on. And how do I navigate through that? So I want to give you two gifts to wrap this up with. First one is really simple. If you are the bit in between all of this information in the past and the present, what that means is you're the thing that's breathing, OK? Lots of, in theatre, they talk about coming back to the breath. Here is a gift that came to me from uh, somebody that lives with, with uh, chronic pain disease. And so they talked about how they manage the chronic pain disease. So it, uh, take one hand, just like the energy thing, but just one hand. Okay, take one finger. And all you're going to do, doesn't matter which one, you don't need to show them. You're going to breathe uh, in and then out. In your own way, don't overstress it. In and then out. Don't hyperventilate. In and then out. And just keep going at your own pace. And you do that as many times as you need. It's a really handy thing. Ha. Awful <laughs> problem. Sorry, that was untested. <laughs> Um, and it, it's a lovely thing that most people can do, uh, but obviously not everybody, but you can make an adapted version of that. The other one, which I think is the way that we'll... Brian, we're on about quarter two? 9.48, cool. So uh, the other one is this. Um, can we take the house lights up a little bit? Can I just say, that back row of people are just amazing. So we'll get lots of praise today because we got through yesterday, which is amazing. Okay. Um, uh, wiggly bum in your chair. Make sure your feet, you know, just so you're comfortable in chair. Okay. Uh, so look around you and uh, just with your eyes, without saying anything, just name in your head five things you can see. You know, stairs, court, just five things.
and then you might reach out and touch four things. Four different things. Three things you can hear. Two things you can taste. And one thing you can smell. And if in the rest of the day, after two days of information bombardment, just keep those in your pocket and use them when you need them. I would like to thank Mara. I would like to thank Autumn. I would like to thank you. And I'm looking forward very much to the next two hours. We'll start again.